Jimmy Briggs is a New York-based writer, teacher, and freelance journalist. He has written articles on conflict and women's rights for numerous publications, including The Washington Post, The Village Voice, Life Magazine, and New York Times Magazine. He served as an advisor to the UN Special Session on Children and Armed Conflict. He has covered conflicts and crises all over the world and was awarded the John Barlow Martin Award from Northwestern University for the story he wrote about the Gulf War's impact on children, later becoming finalist for a National Magazine Award. He is currently completing his second book on women and girls in situations of crisis. Jimmy spends a significant amount of time traveling around the country giving talks to middle school, high school, and university students discussing his work the importance of global awareness, and their potential roles as activists. In fact, he is visiting 10 schools in his short visit to Chicago this week. His book, Innocence Lost, When Child Soldiers Go to War, examines the global tragedy of child soldiers. More than 250,000 children have fought in three dozen conflicts around the world, but growing exploitation of children in war is staggering and unfortunately little known. For the last seven years, Jimmy Briggs has been talking to, writing about, and researching the plight of these young um, combatants. The horrific stories of these children, dramatically told in their own voices, reveal the devastating consequences of this global tragedy. Innocence Lost is arguably the fullest, most personal, and powerful examination yet of the lives of child soldiers. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jimmy Briggs. This, this being mic'd like this, it feels very strange to me. <laughs> I'm so used to holding it. And I, I, want to, I don't want to go to the podium. We're a relatively small, smaller group tonight, so I figured I'd come down here and talk with you amongst two. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the university um, for bringing me here and, and making this happen tonight. And especially, especially thank um, uh, my friend and comrade, Jamie Bender, um, whom I, I met relatively recently, but we, we immediately bonded and, and started nurturing a friendship, which I greatly appreciate and honor. So thank you so much, Jamie, for making this happen. Um, and in some ways, it's, it feels funny to talk too, because as Jamie said, I've been speaking for, you know, to high schools and middle schools since arriving in Chicago uh, Tuesday night. And, and, and I realized, I think yesterday afternoon, how jet-lagged I am and how, uh, how uh, sort of in a gray area I am. I was, I, was in, I was in Uganda for two weeks working on a documentary about hip-hop in Africa and came back from that trip Wednesday night. And then the next day I went to LA for three days. Then I went back home for a night and then went to DC for two days. Then I came here. So in some ways, I'm like, my head is like somewhere up in the air. But um, I appreciate you all coming out this evening to, to converse with me and talk about what I think are some very important issues facing us as global citizens. Um, <clears throat> it, I'm really, in, you know, in some ways, so um, <clears throat> I'm really feeling very, I don't know, it feels weird because earlier today, I was at a high school here in Chicago, Sin High School. And I was talking to a group of kids, about 100 kids, and you know they were in the ninth grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. And I spoke for about an hour and a half about my work as a writer, um, as an advocate sometimes, um, and about my journey to get to this point. And one of the students, after the presentation, you know, the school school is out, and this young man stayed. He's a, he's a senior at Sin, and. Um, he struck me for several reasons. One, because he told me he's going to my alma mater this fall, which made me really proud. I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, where I majored in biology and philosophy. So he's going to Morehouse this fall, and I was very excited to hear that. And then he said to me as I was leaving, you know, thank you so much for coming to my school, because after hearing you speak, <clears throat> I know what I want to do with my life. You know, and I was like, wow. I mean, when he said it, I, it made me so nervous, uncomfortable to have someone say that to me. And I kind of downplayed it. You know, I didn't dismiss him. I'm like, wow, I don't know what to say to you. I said, thank you. Please stay in touch. You know, if you need any help or, or guidance, I'm, you know, you can reach out. And then later on, as I was coming over here, I was reflecting on that. And um, I, mean, I just, 
I was telling Jamie in the car, I said, you know, if for another reason, that what just happened made this trip worth it. You know, regardless of how tired I am, regardless of how I'm feeling, um, regardless of, of my schedule, that made the trip right there, that alone, this young man felt um, what, what we talked about, what we shared with each other, uh, had an impact on his life. Now for me, it's, it's um, when I talk about this work and talk about my book and talk about what I'm doing now, I never, I mean, I know, the, I know these subjects, I know these, these issues so well. You know, I know certain countries very well. Um, I know certain cultures and certain histories very well, but I'm always, um, I'm not 100% confident when I'm talking because you know, it, I realize how, how strange a journey this has been for me. I didn't set out to do this work. I didn't set out to write these stories or have these experiences. Um, you know, when people ask me what I do, some days, you know, the answer is different. I may see a writer one day. I may see an advocate another the next day. I may see a messenger another day. And I say that because, you know, a lot of the time when I'm going to places, I'm just, I'm just present, I'm just a witness, and then I pass on what I see, what I hear. Um, I think like, <clears throat> like many of us um, in this room, those of us who grew up in the United States, I, I really, really grew up buying into the whole soldier mythology. Um, you know, I had a grandfather in World War II, a father in the Army during Vietnam, um, and I, you know, I saw the movies, you know, growing up, Platoon, Commando, Apocalypse Now, things like this. Um, I played war, like many of us do, as boys in our youth. And um, I didn't think I'd, I'd ever be a soldier myself, but I, I thought it was cool. I thought going to war was cool. And when I became a writer or a journalist, I still thought it was cool. Because I felt like, you know, if I could be sent somewhere to cover a war, I must be good. I must, I must know what I'm doing. I must be regarded highly. Um, I, I, I prepared myself for this journey <clears throat> in a very unlikely way. I mean, I grew up, you know, I live in New York, but I grew up in Missouri, just outside of St. Louis. That's where my family is, that's where I'm from. And I, I can't say that I, I, I grew up in a you know, violent or rough neighborhood. I had two parents who both worked and I went to college and I did well in school and you know, it was a, you know, <laughs> relatively smooth ride. Um, but as a journalist, I, I spent a lot of time writing about um, young people. You know, and innately I was drawn to writing about kids. And it was, it was sort of the perfect thing for me to do because when I became a journalist, and again, I didn't study journalism, I didn't take a journalism class in my life or a writing class. I was a biology guy, you know, and, um, and I just, really sort of fell into it. I, I was always a good writer, but I didn't, didn't realize it. But when I became a journalist, you know, I, I was drawn to writing about and trying to convey the experiences of young people in our country. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at gangs uh, in New York City, where I live, in Washington, D.C., um, L.A., other parts of the country. And I guess, you know, as, as, as a black man especially, you know, I really wanted to, to sort of convey what was happening, what I saw was happening to, you know, sort of the, the invisible, the invisibles, I call them, um, black, Latino, Asian youth who were killing each other or being targeted for, for violence, dealing drugs, victims of the drug world, as well as those, those um, circles of society around them, the cops, the doctors, the nurses, the teachers, the family, the parents. I want to understand the ramifications of, of juvenile violence and AIDS and poverty. And, and you know, I, 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 when I say, you'll hear me say a journey a lot because I was, I was half jokingly and today after going to Sin High School, I said to Jamie, you know, my, a lot of my colleagues don't understand why I spend so much time speaking. You know, why do, you spend, why do I spend so much time going to high schools and middle schools or colleges and just talking about my experiences are telling stories. And you know, I really feel most of it, most days I feel like this is my job and that the, the writing is, that's my, that's my hobby, that's my pastime. Not that I, I don't spend most of my time writing, but this is now at a point where this is where my heart lies. Just hanging out and talking to kids, listening and sharing stories and trying to uh, 
draw some lessons from our respective experiences, our respective observations. But I, I you know, in, in having the encounters I did, writing about juvenile violence, I, you know, that was one transformation. Um, spending time in Baltimore with, with mothers who were, were shooting up their, their children with heroin. Um, talking to, 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 to families in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn whose kids were killed or who's, who were forced to take care of brothers or cousins, sons, who were in wheelchairs at a very young age from being shot and surviving. And, 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 and cumulatively, that was a transformation. You know, I, I was going inside my comfort zone. Um, I, I was pushing myself farther. And then in the spring of 1997, at the time I was working at Life Magazine, when Life was a, a glossy monthly, when it was still, um, <laughs> when it was still, uh, it resembled its old self from, from, from the 60s and 50s. Um, I was working at Life Magazine as a staff writer, and Life sent myself and a photographer to the Congo, which was then known as Zaire, um, a very large country in Central Africa. And at the time we went to, went to Zaire, Congo, um, it was the beginning of a civil war where a dictator named Mobutu Sese Seko was facing a very formidable guerrilla force led by a man named Laurent Kabila. And this, this war, this guerrilla war, was being fought to a great degree by children, child soldiers. Now, I had seen young people, I had seen gangbangers, drug dealers, kids who were lookouts, or maybe they carried guns, maybe they were dealing themselves. So I was not familiar with kids with guns, but to see young people in that context, you know, fighting in what we universally recognize as a war was, was, it was shocking, it was disturbing. And so when I saw these kids with my colleague, I mean, they were small, eight, nine, 10 years old. And you know, I said to myself, you know, I didn't know anything about this, you know, this is, this is a tragedy and how could I not know about this? And you know, years later, I, I, I read a quote by a photographer named Joel Sternfeld, who, who said, who wrote that um, every tragedy deserves its own remembrance, its own recognition. Um, every tragedy deserves to be honored, to be recognized. And, and 11 years ago in the, in the Zaire, when I saw these child soldiers, when I first encountered this phenomenon, I said, this is a tragedy. Someone's got to start writing about it. I'm not hearing these stories. In that same encounter, and that same trip in Zaire, it was a very, it was a very heady time, a very impactful trip, because I, we, you know, we saw these child soldiers, and then on that same trip, some of which I write about in the book, some of which I talk about occasionally, these very profound encounters happened. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book on child soldiers' innocence lost is how um, my colleagues and I came across a, a dying refugee on a roadside in the jungle, in the bush, near Kisangani, which is in the northeastern section of the Congo, oh, I keep saying Congo, northeastern section of Zaire, Congo. And um, that region is the region where Joseph Conrad set the heart of darkness for a reason, as I learned. And um, we came across this woman on the side of the road. We were driving our vehicle. She was lying on the side on a stretcher covered up. And she, she was dying. I mean, I mean we, it was obvious that she was dying. Um, partly because she was being, her body stretched on that stretcher, covered up in the blanket. She was being slowly um, eaten by, by animals, by insects. She was covered. And um, we got out and, you know, and looking back, it, I'm, 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 every time I tell the story, I'm increasingly ashamed of it because, you know, I can't believe we did it this way. But we got out of our vehicle and we, you know, basically talked about whether we should leave her there to die or, or take her with us. And of course, we left her there to die. Um, we made the decision that, you know, we couldn't do anything for her. She was too far gone. And that, um, you, know, you know, it would be easier to let, to let her go out that way than try to save her and, and she suffer. And, and I remember, you know, driving, driving past, driving off after we made the decision and, and, and praying. I started praying. I, I wasn't a particularly religious person, but, you know, in that situation, I'm like, it seemed like the right thing to do. Let me pray about this. And um, I remember saying, asking myself and asking God, 
how can this happen? You know, if you do exist, you meaning God, if you do exist, what's the meaning of this? What's the purpose of this? Um, and, and no answers came imme immediately. The next day, uh, my colleagues and I came across an aid station run by the Red Cross in the same region. And there were thousands, I mean, literally thousands of refugees who were seeking help at this small aid station. And these refugees were, were, Wand, were Wandan Hutus. As you probably know, in 1994, there was a genocide where a million people were killed in the course of three months. The Hutus against the Tutsis. When the genocide ended, the Hutus fled to neighboring countries, Tanzania, Kenya, and Zaire. And these refugees were the ones who went to Zaire. And they, three years later, they were still there, stranded, so to speak, slowly being picked off um, by rebels or being shut off from food, from resources. And at this aid station, these Rwandan Hutus, who at this particular point were elderly, they were kids, they were mothers, they were seeking assistance. And, you know, the, the, it was, it's amazing that the Red Cross even decided to set up there because there was no way they could match the need. But still they were giving out, first aid, they were giving out milk and water to the mothers, to the, to the family members. And I remember, you know, once we had done our work, our work meaning taking pictures, filming, interviewing, you know, we, we had time left over before nightfall. And we said, let's, let's help out for a few hours, let's pitch in, which is very rare for journalists to do that. Usually we do our jobs and we're gone. In that situation, we said, let's do something, let's pitch in. And so we pitched in. And somehow I, I ended up, you know, working with the nurses, dealing with, you know, the mothers, the babies. And so over the course of the, the, the time period that we were there, several hours of pitching in, of volunteering with these, with these Red Cross staffers, um, I, 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 without exaggeration, I, I guess about at least 30, 30 35 infants, babies, um, died in my arms before I could give them back to their mothers. Because what I was asked to do was, was um, you know, work with the nurses, and as the mothers would come up, I would take the babies, put dropper, little large droppers of water and milk into the baby's mouths, um, just to give them some sustenance. And then I would hand them back to the, to the mothers. I mean, these mothers were so dehydrated, they were so malnourished that their breast, there was no milk. They couldn't produce any milk, they couldn't feed their kids. So they were coming to this aid station. And so in this time period, I was giving back, you know, some babies were alive, some babies died. And again, you know, this, this uh, another profound encounter of tragedy, of transformation. And I think, you know, after that initial experience in Zaire, in Congo, um, I mean, somewhere inside, I, I, I made an agreement with myself. Um, somewhere inside I was transformed because at that point I knew that I was not gonna have the career that I thought I was gonna have. I didn't, I knew that, you know, for me, it was not going to be enough to get a job at the New York Times or go for the Pulitzer or, you know, try to take Ed Bradley's place on 60 Minutes, like that. And these were all things that I thought about when I first became a journalist. I wanted to be Ed Bradley. You know, I said, this is before I had dreadlocks. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to stay in shape. I'm going to, you know, practice, um, you know, practice, you know, do voice work. I'm going to be Ed Bradley one day. And after that, I'm like, you know what, I don't want any of those things. Um, I just have to use, this is, this is the, the talent I have, this is the blessing I have, the gift I have. You know, I'm a good listener and, you know, on some days I can write a story well. So I said, I'm going to use this, use these things to, uh, to make a difference, to, to, to do some good in the world. To be more than a journalist, but to be, to be a messenger. Well, one of my first trips to, to Uganda, I was in northern Uganda, in a place called Gulu. And an elderly man said to me, if a dying man tells you a story and you don't pass it on, you'll be haunted. And for a long time, when I first started working on, formally working on my book on child soldiers and more affected kids, I felt haunted because writing stories, it didn't seem enough to me. Even, even, I, even when I started working on, this, on my book, it, it wasn't enough. I wanted to do more, which is why you know, I was telling the kids today, I said, that's why I do what I do. That's, that's why I'm here because, you know, I, I have to pass it on. I, I, can't carry this, I can't carry this anymore. I'll, I'll always carry it, but 
you know, maybe if I talk about it, maybe, maybe if you help me see it a different way, um, we can both find some answers, find some lessons on what's happening in these places. Um, over the next six years after going to Zaire, I went to Uganda. I went back to, went back to Zaire, then called Congo. I uh, went to Rwanda a number of times, um, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, uh, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, talking to young people, talking to mothers and fathers, talking to commanders who use kids, talking to kids who weren't child soldiers, but who had been raped, who had been displaced, who had been orphaned. Um, just trying to, you know, trying to make sense of things, trying to find out what are the commonalities, what are the parallels, what are the lessons, um, what's working, what's not working. And um, at the same time, you know, because it, this wasn't totally selfless, at the same time I was trying to find what I'd lost. Um, you know, my mother, she worries about me so much, even now, and she's always worried, like, you know, how are you feeling, what's your mindset, are you sure you want to go back to those, these places? And, um, you know, I always tell her, of course, I have to, I'm okay, don't worry, I'll be fine, you know, it's all good. And, and, but the truth of the matter is, since that first encounter in Zaire, on that roadside, uh, since, since my colleagues and I stopped at that aid station, um, you know, in a very real way, I left a part of myself back there. I, like, a part of me didn't come back from that trip just because, you know, the, the, the death of the horror was so profound. You know, I, could, I wasn't the same person before. I, I know that. People who know me before that trip say I'm not the same person. Um, and for me to keep going back, you know, to Uganda, which I just went to last week, or for me to go to Iraq, where I'm going this September, or I'm sorry, this October, um, part of it, you know, a small part of it is, is a way for me to try to find, uh, find a piece of that light, a piece of that hope that I lost in Zaire. Today, you know, we, we know that we, meaning those of us who focus on these issues, know that women and children and girls um, suffer the most in conflict and crisis. And in a way that, you know, one would say, well, that's obvious, but it's obvious, but it's so obvious we don't talk about it. I was telling um, yesterday, I was at one of the middle schools, I think it was Smythe, and we were talking about the cyclone in Myanmar. And I was saying, you know, Several things struck me because when I, when I heard about the cyclone, I was still in Uganda. I was at a hotel bar in Kampala with a colleague of mine, and I was transfixed because I'm like, first they said over 20,000 people died. And I don't, know, I don't know, just having been in, in conflicts and crisis, having been in New York on 9 11, I, I, can't, even, I can't even picture 20,000 people. I don't, I don't know what that looks like 20,000 people dying at one time. And then when I saw the images of displacement and, and and uh, the, the struggle for water and food, I'm like, wow, this, like, this, I know what it is, this is what it is. And I said to the students yesterday, I said, you, may, you maybe, hopefully you know, what, you know there's a cyclone in, in Myanmar. But I said, you know, think about 20,000 or 100,000 people dying. That's, that's, that's bigger than many towns in this country. And I said, you know, it's not conflict, it's not war. But you know, before the cyclone, Myanmar was known as having the largest number of child soldiers in the world. And when I say child soldiers, I mean young people under the age of 18 years old who are either carrying weapons, acting as cooks, acting as scouts or spies, or maybe sexual servants. I say sexual servants because if you're a girl and you're a child soldier, you suffer what I call a double trauma. I remember going to uh, Uganda, in particular Colombia, a lot of girls in Colombia who were child soldiers would talk to me, and I would even ask them, I never asked any of them to tell me this, but I, you know, I would talk to them about their experiences and what would happen to them. And inevitably, they would talk about being raped, being assaulted, being taken as the wife of adult, an adult commander. Because if you're a girl soldier in many conflicts around the world, most conflicts, regardless of your age, you're gonna end up being sexually violated. And so many girl soldiers, if they survive their war experience, perhaps they survive having one or two kids, or perhaps they survive having AIDS or syphilis, or perhaps they can never have kids because they've been raped so many times, or maybe some combination of all those. And this is, the fate, this is what happens to girls and women in war. This is the reality that we don't talk about, we don't hear about it, 
You know, I work a lot with the UN, I work with NGOs, non-governmental organizations. It's, it's an awkward conversation to have. I remember being in Afghanistan not long, a couple years ago when I was, Af I was in Afghanistan, because um, the first American to die in combat was killed by a 14-year-old Afghan boy. And I, um, and I was talking to someone from Save the Children, Save the Children, and I said, you know, okay, you're working with former child soldiers, they're boys. Um, what's, what's, what's the age picture look like here? Are you testing for STDs? Are you giving them ARVs? And they looked at me blankly and I said, you know, well, how can you not, you know, why are you not even talking about sex and rape? Because we know that the Northern Alliance used boy soldiers. We know that boys, you know, had sex with their commanders. They were ordered to have sex at times. So how can, you know, obvious, you know obviously or perhaps there's a chance of them having HIV or AIDS. Still, blank look. The same thing in the Congo, the same thing in, in Uganda and Colombia. No one wanted to talk about the fact that, that girls primarily, but that boys and girls were being sexually assaulted um, during their military experience. And now, slowly, slowly, we're seeing the ramifications of that because we're seeing AIDS spreading like wildfire in the Congo where 95% of active combatants have HIV and they're not getting ARVs, and they're not getting prophylaxis. Um, and so, you know, when I, when, I, when, I, when I tell these stories, especially in this, in this country, when I, when I visit schools, inevitably someone will say, and someone said it today actually, why did you decide to focus on, on, focus on the world? Why, why are you going overseas? What about here? Why don't I talk about what happens here? Well, I talk, then when, I didn't say it today, but usually when someone asks me that question, as they always do, I respond several ways. I talk about the fact that I spent three months uh, last summer exploring the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. I talk about driving with a colleague, a photographer from New Orleans to Pensacola, Florida, the path of the storm, back and forth several times, visiting the communities most of us have never heard of in this room. I talk about uh, the young people outside of New Orleans who have lost everything, who are in gangs, who are committing crimes. I talk about the fact that we know, we know that people sought shelter in the Superdome, but that we, we don't know that many women, many girls uh, were raped in the Superdome, hiding or seeking refuge from Katrina. Uh, we don't talk about the fact that there are still people today who are cooking by oil drum fire in Mississippi and Alabama. And I said, you know, for me, I've never stopped talking about what happens in my country because, you know, I, 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 in a way I see what happens overseas as a mirror for ourselves. When I talk about child soldiers in Medellin, Colombia, or in Kabul, or, or in Colombo, Sri Lanka, I always bring it back home. I always talk about the lessons I've learned in those countries and how it relates to what happens here. Because you know, I would never compare, you know, I would never compare, you know, the type of juvenile violence or gang gang violence that happens here to being a child soldier, but I would compare the, the aftermath, the legacy of those situations to each other. I, I think that families and the community who have to deal with the aftermath of, of, a, of a gang shooting, or have to deal with kids being abducted and forced to fight, I think the trauma is very similar, and I think there are lessons to be learned from both situations. My book uh, on child soldiers and warfare to kids came out in 2005. And, and, and since that time, in the ensuing years, um, the transformation's been complete. I say that because, you know, now, when asked, I say, first and foremost, I'm an advocate. I'm a messenger. I pass stories on. Um, sometimes I'll suggest remedies or solutions. But I feel like, you know, for me, going to these places and, and the inherent risks that are involved is enough a lot of, a lot of times. And if I can just pass these stories on and sh share their experiences, what I've seen, what I've heard, what people have told me, um, that's doing a good thing. Um, at the same time, I, I become more and more um, determined that we in this country, especially our young people, have to be global citizens, have to be global advocates. You know, I said to the kids, for the past two days I've been saying to, to middle school and high school kids, 
I've been begging them, think about the fact that the United States is in two major wars. I've been to one of them, Afghanistan. I'm going to the other one, Iraq, this fall. Two major wars. I mean, these, these are not you know, brief skirmishes like Grenada or Panama. These, these are like long-term wars where people are going to be coming back home in body bags, possibly worse. Uh, and I said, you know, you know, many of us have family members or friends who are going to these places or coming back. What are they seeing? What are they experiencing? What's the impact on them? And what's our responsibility to them when they come back? And I said, think about the fact that you know, these family members, these friends, are increasingly facing child soldiers, are increasingly facing situations where the things I mentioned earlier are happening, displacement, um, AIDS, rape, all these things are happening in combination with each other. With each other. Um, I have to ask myself at times, and again, people, students ask me all the time, is it worth it? Um, do you regret it? You know, can you go back? And I say, I can't go back now. You know, I, if I was going to go back, I would have gone back before I went to Zaire that first trip. There's no going back. But the, you know, the hope for me now is that they, our children, our grandchildren, finally um, start to heed some of the lessons that we haven't, that I haven't heeded, that my parents haven't heeded. I was talking to um, a man named Luis Moreno Ocampo a few months ago. And Mr. Ocampo, Senor Ocampo, is the chief prosecutor at the ICC at The Hague, the International Criminal Court. And he said something, um, what he said, it was beautiful. It was, it was, it was so beautiful, I let it marinate for weeks. He said, um, people don't get tired, individuals don't get tired. Or people, people get tired, individuals get tired, but movements don't get tired. And so for me, that, that's, that's my motto, because you know, some days I'm like up, I'm a minute, you know, I'm, ex I'm pumped up, excited about it. Some days I'm like, I'm sick of this. You know, like no one cares. You know, I'm tired of being in America. It's like I have to do the, 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 the soft shoe sell to get people to listen to what I'm saying or to make a difference. And all these issues we're talking about, they're not, they're not insurmountable. They're not challenges we can't overcome. There are solutions, there are responses. And you know, we, you know, by, by, not, by ignoring them or dismissing them or saying that you know, it happens over there, those are not our kids, they don't speak our language, they're not our color, they're not our religion, it all comes back, it all comes back to us in one form or another. Um, again, I want, I want to thank you all for coming tonight and I, I just appreciate this opportunity for me to, uh, <laughs> to, con to vent, to confess to you. <laughs> and hopefully to have a, a very uh, uh, productive conversation and dialogue um, in the coming minutes and, and hour. The video which I, which I brought with me <clears throat> is a 10 minutes uh, excerpt from a documentary in progress based on my book. Um, it's, it's hopefully will be completed by the end of this year. And it's a documentary which will um, sort of retrace uh, visits to the Congo, to Colombia, and, and, and to Sri Lanka. And so after the video is shown, uh, you know, I'll take questions, I'll ask questions, and we can go back and forth in that way. Th thank you again for coming this evening. Do you mean the light's down or? Okay.
people think of it as an African problem because that's, those are the images that they tend to see on their television. But you know, there are large numbers of child soldiers in Asia, in Burma, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Colombia. Um, certainly children have gotten involved in the insurgency in Iraq. The first American soldier to die in combat in Afghanistan was killed by a 14-year-old child soldier. Where children in the earlier wars may have been messengers and spies, uh, and uh, those kinds of things, they were never combatants because they couldn't carry those weapons. They could warn them with these small weapons. Someone said it takes a child, they say, 30 minutes to master AK-47. What is the strategy to deal with if you're in the army or engaging as predominantly child soldiers? I mean, what do you do when you take them prisoners of war as well? How do you treat them? What do you do? Sex slaves, then they give birth to children, you know, uh, and 
sort of end up in this very complicated relationship.
it's interesting because, uh, every, every, and this is not an indictment of anyone, uh, especially not myself, but whenever I show this video, especially when I've been showing it at, at schools or high schools, it's interesting just to listen to the emotional responses because inevitably there's always a, a gasp, uh, collective gasp, when, when they see the kid with the cigarette, the little boy smoking the cigarette. And then, you know, that, that gasp it usually equals the gasp when they see a child carrying AK-47. Um, I mean, kid, you know, kids, adults, the same response in a lot of ways. Um, just before we, we, we have a conversation, one thing I want to say is, um, and this is sort of a, a postscript to this video, is that there actually, there actually are two significant bills in the U.S. Congress. One um, is called the International Violence Against Women Act, um, which I'm, I've been focusing on a lot lately because the book I'm writing now is about rape and war. And that, the International Violence Against Women Act um, would, would uh, punish groups or governments for committing crimes of sexual violence. It would um, provide a tremendous, tremendous amount of assistance to groups, to governments, dealing with um, providing reproductive health care in crisis and conflict as well as uh, funding programming to protect women, to increase gender protection, to work with men who are perpetrators, to work with men as gender advocates, gender, gender defenders. Uh, the, the, other, the other piece of legislation deals with child soldiers. And um, that, the, that bill would do exactly what the one from Human Rights Watch said. It would punish governments, punish groups, when you use children um, in any capacity in combat, and prohibit the U.S. from providing military assistance to governments or groups which use your children. It would um, allow the U.S. to freeze funds, limit travel of individuals that recruit or command children uh, in combat. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, I want to mention that in case, you know, for those of you who don't know what it is, the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, is an international agreement, um, legislation, uh, resolution, which um, basically identifies the inherent rights of children throughout the world. I mentioned the Convention of the Rights of the Child because the United States is the only country in the world which has not ratified and, and signed the convention. Um, and I think partly, well, first of all, I, I think the CRC, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, it's not, it's, it's enforceable, but I think its force comes from its symbol because it says, these are the rights of all children, and it outlines them very specifically. Uh, shelter, education, uh, food, healthcare. At the same time, I think this is why the US has been so reluctant to, to come on board with it, even when we had a Democrat in the White House, is because there are a number of people in this country who feel that the convention uh, gives girls, for example, um, reproductive health care rights. So it, for those people who are against abortion or against abortion rights, they have a problem with this convention. Also, the convention says um, children under the age of 18 can't be executed. They can't face the death penalty. So again, that's a problem for the United States because obviously um, we do execute juveniles. Uh, the third thing is that the United States um, in order to meet its enlistment, its military enlistment goals, its targets, has to recruit, has to reach out to 17-year-olds. I mean, if we, didn't, if we didn't have 17-year-olds in the U.S. military forces, we would never make our target goals. Um, we need 17-year-olds to do that. And so the convention says, you know, you can't use 17-year-olds, you can't be under 18 and, and be, um, be a soldier. And so there, there, there are a number of factors why the convention um, has not been fully endorsed by this country. Again, I think, you know, its power is largely large symbolic, but for the U.S. to come on board with the Convention on Rights of the Child would say to the world, we take children's rights seriously. This, this is important to us. Um, this matters to us. We have, um, we have the regional courts. We have the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, ICTY. We have the ICTR for Rwanda. We have the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which has been good about going after individuals who use child soldiers. Um, I guess the criticism or knock against the ICC is that, one, is that they've been largely going after African 
criminals, which at some point is going to become a huge problem. I think the, the, the other issue is that the International Criminal Court um, has not been going after people for acts of sexual violence, even when, that, when that's tied to the use of child soldiers. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of hope and potential with that court, with that judicial body, but there's still, of course, a way, ways to go. Um, in the remaining time, I was hoping we could, you know, I think it's like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, we can have a conversation or a back and forth about what I've said, about the video, about reactions, thoughts. Yes, Chris. Talk uh, earlier about the consequences and the health uh, issues. Um, we, we, you know, the, the, the tragedy of South Asia is obvious, but what about the aftermath? Um, one of the chilling things for me in, in watching the, the, uh, the documentary was to see how um, normal the, the, these children were in, in talking about the horrors that they were experiencing. Um, what's being done to reintegrate uh, these, these children into society? How effective is it? Well, thank you very much. Chris Benson, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Chris is a friend as well from the University of Illinois. I, I um, well, first of all, thank you for asking, and the question itself is, raises an interesting point because you know, I was talking before about lessons learned, and it was so funny to me when I, when I, go to, when I would go to Uganda or go to Colombia or go to Afghanistan and talk to people from UNICEF or Save the Children or World Vision about their work with war affected kids and child soldiers, because in, in, in most countries, I won't say all, but in most countries, um, there, are, there are some programs, there's something for former child combatants. There's something for kids who've been affected by war. There's, there, there's little to nothing for girls who've been raped, but there's something for child soldiers. And it was interesting to me because, you know, I would ask people, I would, say, I would comment, I would say, you know, it's funny, in my country, in the U.S., um, there's, no, there's no rehabilitation program, there's no uh, trauma recovery program um, if you've been a gangbanger or a drug dealer or if you've been a victim of, of, of violence. Um, there's no, there's no, you know, there aren't, there, aren't re, there aren't formal resources to help you cope or recover from what you've seen. There's no reconciliation effort, you know, so that, you know, one block or one project reconciles with the other one. Um, perhaps jail would be the, the, closest, the closest thing we have. But in many of these places, and I point to Colombia especially, Colombia and Uganda, because they have a pretty strong network of rehabilitating child soldiers. What happens when, when kids either escape or they're, they're rescued or they're, they're wounded and survive, they're left, they're left to die and they survive, they're demobilized, which means they're, they're disarmed, their weapons are taken away, they, they turn them over. And then usually they're sent to some sort of um, center, a pro formal program or center, where they receive counseling, where they can, you know, re they receive individual therapy and group therapy for what they've gone through. Um, the best, pro the better programs also incorporate some sort of educational component or vocational training. Many kids who become child soldiers, they join, such as the woman in that video, who, jo you know, she joined, she became a child soldier in Uganda at nine. By the time she got out, she was 18. So technically, she was an adult. And unfortunately, that, that's a very common situation because kids, young people become child soldiers at a young age. If they get out, if they survive and get out, they're 18, 19, 20. And so they're past the age, technically, where UNICEF or Save the Children can help them, but, you know, according to their mandates. And so um, I, I think that the vocational training is important because and I just met someone in Uganda a few weeks ago, this was his story. He, he, was, he was, by the time he got out, he, he, he went back to school, but he was so much older than the other kids. I mean, he, I think he was 18, and he was, a, he was in a class with third graders or second graders. So, I mean, he was back in school, but it was very stigmatizing to him, you know, to have to be in school with these little kids, and, you know, he was being teased and bullied because of that. And so I think, you know, there, there have to be, the better programs have alternatives to support the older former child soldiers who were adults. I mean, the, the, the rehabilitation is long term. It's not just, it can't just be a few years um, because, you know, some of these kids have been, such as the girl in the video and Ishmael Bayo, who some of you may be familiar with, he wasn't a child soldier for that long, 
but m many child soldiers, you know, they're in, their, in it for years. And so it takes that much longer than some, to, you know, to sort of heal from those experiences and be, and be accepted back into society. Yes, hi. You talked about UNICEF and Save the Children. Are those two organizations that you favor? <laughs> I mean, you know, if, we, if people want to do something yeah. I won't say favor. I mean, they're good at their jobs. I mean, they're very good. I mean, they're, they're, they're that would be cynical to say that. They're, they're institutions that are very good at their job. UNICEF, I, I, you know, I won't say I favor. I, I, I urge people to look at a UNICEF and Save the Children. The Inter International Rescue Committee is very good. World Vision, based out of California, you know, they're, they're probably the, the largest the largest one on the block, so to speak. They have a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of resources. They're good. Um, and even you know, in some countries like Colombia, the Colombian government has its own rehabilitation program, which is quite good. I like that one especially because um, the Colombian government program, when they rehabilitate child soldiers or war affected kids, they incorporate magical realism. You know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is Colombian. And so it was, it was amazing how they do it, but they, they use that they would use his poetry or literature or, or the work of other authors to, to have the kids um, tell their stories in a, in a non-traumatizing way and, and really kind of, you know, sort of release, release to the therapist, release to the group what's happened to them. And it, it seems to work when I saw. Yes. So uh, bringing it kind of here to the local, you probably know we have had a sad as you go and talk to high school students, do you make parallels? Yeah. And what's going on as far as violence going on here in the United States and Sure. Thank you for the question. I, 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 I always do that. I, I mean, that's one of the reasons. I mean, I won't say I target schools who have these issues, but I, I, I think I'm much more inclined to say yes to a school that has these issues um, when I go speak or talk about my work or talk about advocacy or these types of issues because um, I think there are definite parallels, there are, there are definite lessons, and I, I can't trust that enough. I, I remember about a year, I think it was a year ago, actually, when I think about it a long time, about a year ago, I, I spoke to a middle school, a fourth grade class in East New York, in Brooklyn. And um, it was a you know, very, I can't remember the name of the neighborhood at, right now, but it was a very poor neighborhood. It was an extraordinarily violent neighborhood. I mean, I could see that in the daytime going there. Um, you know, because you can, you kinda, at a certain point, you kind of know who's dealing drugs. You see the gang signs, you know, okay, this, there's a lot going on here. And I, sp I, went, I spoke to a fourth grade class, which is, the youngest class I've ever spoken to, the only time I, I did that. And, and I didn't show the video, um, but I, I read, read some parts from my book and talked about some of the stories I, I had heard and seen, especially in Central Africa. Um, a, a number of the kids were, 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 um, were Latino, so I spoke about Colombia. Um, some of the kids were Asian, so I spoke about Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. And uh, at a certain point, in this conversation with these eight, nine-year-old kids, one of the kids just kind of blurted out, I thought I was alone. And he said, I, 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 didn't, know, I, didn't, know, I didn't know people around the world experienced this. I didn't know their kids went through this. I, you know, he, I, mean, I, was, I almost started crying, actually, and he said, he's like, because he said, I, I thought I was the only one who went through this. I, I didn't know, I thought, in my block, this is what happens on my, on my block, in my borough. Um, I didn't know the kids on the road had to sleep on the floor or bury relatives or hear gunfire or, or, or have guns in the home to protect themselves. And when he said it, I mean, I thought about it for a long time afterwards. You know, it sort of really crystallized for me why it's so important to make these connections because, you know, I, I, you know again, I go back to the fact that we can, and I certainly do, use these, these tragedies, these experiences overseas, these stories as a mirror for what's happening here. In the past few days since I've been in Chicago, you know, I kind of suspected, and it was confirmed later, one of the schools, you know, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were, had gang issues. And, um, you know, and last week I spoke at a high school in Long Beach, 
California. And you know, going in, I knew that this community, this school, had a lot of, had a lot of brown, black issues. You had a lot of issues with Mexican kids and black kids, you know, gang banging against each other or starting fights or whatever. And you know, I was very, I was very particular, I was very conscious when I spoke about what I saw overseas, when I spoke about these stories, to bring it back to those contexts, to talk about gangs, to talk about black-brown tension. Um, and you know, to, to, to ask the kids always, you know, you know, what do they take from, what do they take from these stories? What are they learning? I mean, what, how do they feel about it? And then we talk about, let's, let's bring it back home. Let's talk about banging. Let's talk about, you know, the fact that, you know, if you're Mexican or black, you can't go into this neighborhood or on this block. You know, let, let's, let's bring it back to ourselves. Um, I, I think we're so, we're so easy, we're, we're easier to talk about what happens overseas, what happens at, at a distance, and it's much more difficult to talk about what happens in our communities or in our cities. And I, I, I even told the kids yesterday, I said, you know, you, you know, you live in one area of Chicago, which I don't know that well, but you live here. You know, I live in New York, and <laughs> I told, the, I told the kids in Long Beach the same thing. I said, you know, you live here, I live there. And, you know, I could, you know, sad to say, most people where I live don't know about what's happening in their community and may not even care what's happening in their community, to be, to be honest about it. And I said, in Chicago, I'm sure there are neighborhoods where people could care less what's happening around this, element, around this, around this middle school um, or in Illinois. And the same thing in California, in LA, um, Studio City, who cares what happens in Long Beach? And, and so I said, you know, for, uh, for, us, for those of us who are in it, who live it, who care about it, who have to, who have to deal with, with, with the ramifications of it, um, you know, let, let's, you know, no one, I mean, no one cares already, so let's just tie it all together. If we're gonna talk about gangs, let's talk about gangs and child soldiers. You know, let's talk about, let's talk about AIDS in Africa and AIDS here. You know, let's tie it all together, so that way people, you know, when they're, when they're looking, when they're looking at, at the Darfurians, or when they're looking at the people in Myanmar, they're also seeing the, the people in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. You know, let's tie it together, and then we can't run away from it, you know. Yeah. I happen to know a family from Sierra Leone mm -hmm. that, that left and took their children with them. And I just wondered if the problem is still prevalent there. In Sierra Leone and, and in Liberia, um, technically these are post-conflict situations. Technically they're not at war anymore, but um, they very much are in it. They're very much done with the legacy of those wars. And those two cases in particular, especially Sierra Leone, um, where conflict diamonds, where blood, di blood diamonds were an issue, um, they have some serious social challenges because they don't have the resources or the, the capacity, the full capacity, to, to assist all the young people who need counseling, who need rehabilitation, who need to be demobilized, disarmed. And so, you know, they're dealing with, with street kids, with street criminals. And in some cases, and this is a, a regional problem in West Africa, um, Human Rights Watch actually did a huge report about it last year, um, you have former, former child soldiers in one country, um, and then the, the war ends in their, in their home country, and for, out of lack of resources or response, they end up becoming mobile and going to neighboring countries as mercenaries. Um, that happened in Cote d'Ivoire when, when, when they were fighting there a year and a half or two years ago. You know, you had people from Liberia and Sierra Leone going to those countries, going to, like, going to Cote d'Ivoire, um, fighting in that war, you know? So, uh, you know, in that part of Africa particularly, there's concern. The governments aren't that strong, even though Liberia has a, as its first woman president, um, still, the governments are not sh that strong to overcome the, the post-conflict uh, crime, the post-conflict rape. Liberia just established um, a rape court because the rapes have gone up since the war ended which is kind of paradoxical on a certain level. You'd think they would go down, but the rapes have gone up. We have time for one last question. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering if in your travels and oh, well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that you, know, you can see 
um, either people or either, either organizations or individuals are looking at the broad, broad picture, um, or they're looking at very specific things. When I say broad, broad, I mean, you know, people talk about, I mean, there are a lot of, obviously, a lot of groups and advocacy around Darfur, um, which is a broad topic to talk about. Um, but in terms of connecting all the, all the, all the pieces of the, of the puzzle which caused that crisis, um, you know, that, for lack of a better phrase, that's not as sexy. I mean, that's much more, you know, you talk about history, you talk about politics, economics. Um, I think your point's a great one, though, because one of the things, you know, I talk about, or try to talk about at times, and others do as well, is how much these are connected. I remember when I, my book first came out, to be honest with you, some of the early reviews weren't great. And I remember one of the reviews talked, it said, you know, it's too broad. He's talking, I mean, this is a book on child soldiers, but he's talking about all these other issues. And I actually wrote the person back and I said, you can't, you can't talk about child soldiers from my perspective, having actually been to these countries, you cannot talk about child soldiers and not talk about uh, the, the, the broken family structure or talk about the poverty or talk about uh, the disease, um, which make people vulnerable to being recruited forcibly or otherwise. Um, and you have to talk about conflict resources. Um, you have to talk about natural resources which become conflict resources. I think the Congo, the Congo, Sierra Leone is a great example. Liberia, a great example. Congo, you, you've got gold, you've got diamonds, you've got cassiterite and copper, coltan. You know, the Congo has the the highest res, highest reserve uh, uh, highest reserve of the mineral the mineral which is found in, in cell phones. So obviously, you know, that's a very lucrative resource, and and um, you know. These conflicts, you know, I always ask, I always ask myself before I go anywhere, even if I know nothing about the conflict or the history of it, I always, I always ask, ask people, where's the money? Like, where's, where's the money? You know, I, okay, religion, fine, where's the money? You know, once you strip away all those, you know, religion and the fight for autonomy, it, it always comes down to money, you know? Um, and, and once you, I feel, I feel like once you start there, then you can have an honest conversation about things. I know when I, was in, when I was in Colombia, you know, I would talk to these former, but I would talk to child soldiers, and I would talk to former child soldiers. And the former child soldiers in Colombia, they were always, whenever I talked to them, no matter who they were or what group they'd been with, they were so angry. Like, I, I was taken aback how angry they were. And, and I would ask them, like, you know, tell me about, you know, where, where is this coming from? You know, can't you forgive and move on? And they would say, well, we were told we were fighting for this reason. And then you find out it's really this reason. You know, so if you're with the ELN or the FARC in Colombia, for example, you know, maybe you were told you're fighting for the liberation of poor people or this is a socialist, socialist revolution. And I remember one, one kid named Luis said to me, you know, I believe that, I bought into, bought into that. And then soon enough, we're kidnapping people. You know, I'm guarding kidnap victims. Or, you know, we're, or we're, you know, we're, 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 we're traveling with cocaine shipments. You know, it's, it was about something totally different than what we were told, you know, or, or we're attacking pi oil pipelines, um, or, you know, or we're, we're blackmailing people to give us funds from the oil pipeline. I mean, it was always about the money at the end of the day and, 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 and poverty and, and, and political corruption. And I, I think, you know, I say sometimes to people, people, some, people usually often say, how do we stop Child, so how do we stop the use of child soldiers? What can we do to end this? And, I, and as naive as it may sound, as far-fetched as it may sound, I think really the only successful, uh, sustainable way to stop the use of child soldiers is to stop war. Because now we're at a point where, you know, most wars, if not all wars that are being fought today, have child soldiers present. I mean, and I always challenge people, I say, name a war where you don't find child soldiers. And no one ever can, because I, you know, if you name a, name a war or any conflict, whether it's a you know um, mid level to low level to full, there are child soldiers there. Iraq, Afghanistan, Congo, Darfur—I mean, everywhere. There were child soldiers in the Balkans. There were kids in Northern Ireland. There were kids in West Bank, Gaza, obviously. Um, 
this is where we are in 2008. So I, I think the only way to really stop it is to stop the wars themselves, one war at a time. Okay, um, well, thank you so much to Jimmy Briggs. Thank you. Uh,